cultivation. And so here was, here was the guy, Atherton, who was the heir of another person who had bought land that he thought was part of a Mexican land grant, but it turned out it wasn't. And so he had this huge area of land that he claimed as a ranch. The Court of Private Land Claims it was established in California for the purpose of determining whether or not some of these Mexican land grants were legit or not. Ruled that this was not a legit grant. He didn't really own the land. So technically, overnight, the title to this land was no longer privately owned. It was now owned by the federal government. So a lot of people started moving onto his ranch and taking up homesteads, preemption claims, claiming, oh, this is public land. It belongs to the United States. We can move on there. And it went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And in a previous case, um, Whitney versus Frisbee, the Supreme Court said no. Even though that land far exceeded the amount you could claim under the agricultural land laws, it wasn't more than what he could claim under both the agricultural and mineral land laws, and therefore it was a legitimate claim. So they ended up kicking these homesteaders off, because remember the principle, once you've settled on the land and occupied it and proved it, it's no longer public land, right? You understand that, right? So then what he, this Atherton, he said, well, while this homesteader was on my land, it took over a year to get him off of there, to clear him off. He cut a bunch of hay and sold it. He said, well, that, that hay belongs to me. And it went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and this is what the Supreme Court said. It follows that the later settlers could not have made any lawful entry on the lands where the hay was cut in this case that no law existed which gave them any right to make such an entry, that they were mere naked trespassers making an unwarranted intrusion upon the enclosure of the earlier stock raiser, an enclosure and occupation of years on which time and labor and money had been expended, and that in a, such a wrongful attempt to seize the fruits of other men's labor, there could be no bona fide claim of right whatever. The instruction of the court that this could be done found on an erroneous view of the preemption law was itself erroneous, and the judgment found on it must be reversed. So this was the first case where the Supreme Court said the rancher owns that forage. It is his. It is property. So even though the title of the land might have still been in the federal government, because he had settled the land, occupied it, improved it, fenced it, made improvements to the land, it's his. And they had to pay it. Now, I, the reason I give these citations is so you can look it up. You can go to Justia and look it up and read the whole case for yourself. Okay, this is not Angus McIntosh's interpretation of what the Supreme Court said. This is word for word exactly what the Supreme Court said. And the land department followed this policy from that day forward to the point where it's even referenced in the decisions of the land department as the Atherton Fowler Doctrine. So the forge improvements, structures, the practices constructed, developed, or permanently placed on land were property, even before the United States legal title vested in the settler. The Fifth Amendment to the Constitution states, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Okay? So even the federal government could not take this land away and give it to someone else without due process and just compensation. Uh, therefore, the government must give due process and just compensation to stock raisers for the improvements, including forage and grazing value, even when exercising constitutional power. Here's a case 
um, I believe it was this U.S. versus Crest, was in Wyoming, where they built a reservoir, Alcova Reservoir, which flooded a huge area to, to build this reservoir. And the rancher said, hey, you flooded all of my land, and that's my ranch, that's my range, that's my feed in the U.S. Supreme Court. And the government argued, well, we are the federal government, and we can build these dams and create these irrigation reservoirs. We have power to do that, and it doesn't matter if he's settled on that, on that land or he's claiming that range. We're the federal government. And the Supreme Court said, that doesn't matter. Even if you're exercising a constitutional power, you still can't use that power to take private property. You must pay for it. So through a series of statutes uh, passed in the 1800s and 1900s, um, Congress sanctioned, confirmed, and granted split estate property rights on, uh, in the arid mineral region west of the 100th meridian. These statutes granted and confirmed water rights, easements, grazing allotments. Here's some cases you can read. Watt versus Western Nuclear, 1983. You can write these down. California v. U.S. This is a really good explanation of the difference between uh, what's called the prior appropriation water doctrine and the riparian water doctrine, which prevails in the eastern United States. In this case of U.S. versus New Mexico, the same year, both of these cases were written by Justice Rehnquist. Um, in this case, he says that the ranchers own the stock water rights in national forests. It had always been the intent of Congress that those ranchers own the stock water rights. Okay, they're and they said that national forests were not established for aesthetics, um, wildlife or fish preservation, or environmental purposes. That they were established, national forests were established for economic purposes. And the two purposes for which national forests were established was as the gentleman from Montana said, did he leave already? Okay. To produce timber and to enhance water flow. And to enhance that water flow for the purpose of making that water available for private appropriation. And they said if, if the Supreme Court said that if we now accept all these claims for wildlife and fish and recreation and all these other purposes that the federal government was claiming, it would actually defeat the very purpose for which national forests were created. Okay, that's what it says. I, I urge you, look these cases up, read them yourself. Seeing is believing. In this case, Kenny Coastal Oil versus Keeper. In these cases, 78, 83, this one was 78. That's not ancient for anybody in here except Zach. Okay? That's, that's not ancient law. That's modern law. Okay? Now, this case in 1928 was a little earlier case. And people say, well, you still got to get a permit. Well, this is the reason why the Forest Service started issuing permits in the 1920s to ranchers is because of this case. This was, remember in 1916, Congress fully adopted the split estate land policy by a, seri a whole series of laws that they passed in that year, including the Stock Raising Homestead Act, okay, of which this case, Watt versus Western Nuclear is about. Another case, uh, law passed the same year, I know, the year before, 1914, was the one discussed in this case. Another split of state law Congress passed called the Agricultural Entry and Mineral Lands Act. And in that case, this guy had like 800 acres of land. Okay, remember, there was no acreage limitation under the mineral land laws. In 1902, Congress adopted what was called the unit policy. Instead of a set amount of land, like 160 or 320 
or 640 acres, under the unit policy, you would acquire, and this is how it's quoted in the 1902 Act, an amount of land sufficient for the support of a family. So if you're in central Idaho somewhere, and you got a ranch with 200 sections of sagebrush, then that must be how much is needed for the support of a family. Okay, but under the mineral land laws, the government kept the minerals, the rancher had that surface right. And that's why they can sell it. If you want to buy a ranch, some people say, well, how come that rancher gets to run cows out there? Why can't I? Hey, go make him an offer. I'm sure he'd be glad to let you take over his position with the BLM. Okay? So, this case, Kenny Coastal Oil versus Keeper, an oil company had a lease, an oil lease. The rancher found out about it, so he goes out and he starts building a town. Literally starts building a town, laying out streets, building stores, selling lots, because under, under the split of state law, the mineral developer had to pay for any damage to the surface. So he thought he was gonna make a killing on this. And it went all the way to the US Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, no, no, no. This doesn't, this, this right surface right that you have is limited for agricultural and ranching purposes. And so after that, the Forest Service started requiring that, okay, before you build anything out there on your allotment, you gotta check with us first to make sure there's not some kind of mineral activity that we have going on there. Okay, so this, when people say, well, how come if the rancher owns your ranch, how come they gotta get a permit? This is why, to avoid these kind of conflicts. That's why the Ninth Circuit, I was, I was an expert witness in the Court of Claims for the original Hage case and an expert witness for the Hages in uh, the trespass case in front of Judge Jones in, in the District Court in Nevada. And in, in that case, the part of the argument was that they were trespassing, Hages were <coughs> trespassing. That was the second case, the trespass case. And they were saying he owes money because he's caused damage. At that time, we did not know about this act of 1853. I didn't find out about that. I didn't, my research didn't show up that uh, case until afterwards. If we had pled that in the trespass case, I think it would have gone completely, you know, it, it, there would have been bulletproof. Okay, but even the Ninth Circuit did not say, Hage did not own his allotment, and they didn't say he doesn't own his water rights. What they said was he has to have a permit. Now, let me, let me put this into context. Let's say you own a house here in, what town are we in? Is this Boise? Yeah. Nampa, this is Nampa. You own a house in Nampa, okay? You own it. You own a piece of, you say you own a house, but what you own is a piece of property, a piece of real estate, and you have improvements on it. And one of those improvements is your house. And let's say you want to expand your value of your property, and you want to build a shop building behind your house. You're on two acres. You want to build a shop building on that piece of land. Well, if you're in a city limits, most cities, I'm assuming Nampa too, you have to get a building permit. Now, because you have to get a building permit, does that mean that now the city of Nampa owns that shop building? No. The purpose of the permit is to make sure that you don't build that shop like a fire trap in the middle of a residential neighborhood, or that you don't encroach on your neighbor's property. Okay, the purpose of that permit is to protect other people's property interests. Just like in this case of Kinney Coastal versus Keeper, the purpose of the permit was to make sure, not that the rancher doesn't build any improvements, but that he doesn't build any improvements that interfere with the government's 
oil leasee or some other property owner's interest. Does that make sense? Okay. So, the land in the west was arid, physically different than the east. It was mineral land. Um, you can read these two cases, California v. U.S., Watt versus Western Nuclear. Here's the references. Uh, you can go to the United States Code and find all these under Title 25, 43, um, and, and Title 30. Okay, here's the United States in uh, 1879. These are called isolates. They're, they show precipitation zones. This is the 30 inch rainfall zone. And Congress knew that west of that 30 inch rainfall zone, west of the 100th meridian, that you could not grow crops on any reliable basis. Okay, this is discussed in that uh, California versus US case that I just cited a minute ago. That one right there. Okay, fully discussed by Justice Rehnquist and explained that um, this is in the East, there is a doctrine of law called riparian doctrine. And the riparian doctrine of law, under that, the word riparian comes from the Latin word ripa, which means bank, as in a stream bank. Okay? occurs and it's applied in areas where water is abundant and at a time when fishery consumption and transportation were the dominant uses and under a legal system that recognized each owner of land along the water course had the same right to the reasonable use of the water as it flows through his <coughs> land. So some guy in Minnesota has the same right to the use of the Mississippi River as a guy living in New Orleans. That's the riparian doctrine. However, west of the 100th meridian, we have what's called the prior appropriation water doctrine. First in time, first in right. The first person to put that water to beneficial use has the senior water right. Okay, so the next time the Forest Service or BLM guy comes out there and says, oh, your riparian zone is all messed up, blah, 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 guess what? There's no such thing in the state of Idaho is a riparian zone, okay? Because Idaho is governed under the prior appropriation water doctrine. And you just had a great Supreme Court decision um, in the LU ranching case, okay? Which recognized that the rancher owns the water rights. Okay, if you guys, you guys are familiar with that, right? Okay. So why, so, so let's look at this. This is not, again, this is not my map. This comes from uh, the United States Code. These are ports and navigable waterways of the United States. Have you ever heard the term waters of the United States? <laughs> this is the waters of the United States. These are the navigable waters of the United States because this is where interstate commerce occurs, because these are actually navigable in fact. And where is that 100th meridian? Right there. Okay, there's only one navigable waterway of any consequence. It's the Columbia River. It's considered a navigable waterway. So, when they tell you, oh, you're riparian this, you're riparian that, the, I believe it was the, was it Rapanos case just a couple of years ago? Um, on wetlands, the Supreme Court said the wetland has to be immediately adjacent to the main stem of that navigable waterway to be considered a wetland. Now, of course, you're going to say, well, that's not what the Army Corps of Engineers told me. That's not what the BLM told me. You know what? I used to work for the government. I would not believe a thing they say. <laughs> okay. But the thing is, the thing is, they can, they can coerce you if you don't know what your rights are, if you don't know what the law is. And they will. Okay? So you have to know your rights. The question is, are your county commissioners... 
There you are. Are your county commissioners, your county attorney, and your county sheriff going to stand up for your rights? Okay, because that's what that first case is about in that handout I gave you. Okay, Wilson versus Cook. That was a timber sale. It was in the state of Arkansas, but it doesn't matter. It could have been in Idaho because they talk in there about the fact that this national forest was established from two kinds of land. Land that was previously public land before Arkansas became a state and land that had been purchased by the United States afterwards. And they said it didn't matter. And they even quote from the Weeks Act in there, which says that the state does not lose its jurisdiction simply because the government bought the land or even owns the land. And that's where you need to understand the difference between ownership and jurisdiction. 1817 of the Constitution and 432 of the, con of the Constitution. Two different things. It's called proprietary ownership. The government can own land. I guarantee you, some in, somewhere in your town, wherever you live, somebody got a direct loan from the federal government through HUD or, or USDA and then defaulted on that loan and now the federal government owns that house. They own a house. Now, if somebody breaks a window in that house, is the FBI going to come in and investigate that? or the local sheriff? The local sheriff. Because just because the government owns something doesn't mean they have jurisdiction. It's called proprietary ownership. They're simply an owner, like any other owner. The only difference is they can't be taxed. That's the only constitutional power. Because under the Enclave Clause, until the state grants them jurisdiction, they don't have jurisdiction. And you, and you say, ah, oh, Angus, you're making this stuff up. Turn to the second to last page of that handout I gave you. Because there's several things in there. Just turn to the second to last page. I think that's the right one. I'm going to look on Zach's here. Okay. And it got kind of put out of order. But... If you look, sorry about that. If you, if you start at the bottom, here where it says an act to waive any exclusive jurisdiction over premises, okay? Now, this was passed in 1936. This was after the um, Dust Bowl, Dur or during the Dust Bowl era and the Great Depression. Congress passed, in, starting in 1933, a whole series of laws. They call them conservation laws, but they were actually resettlement and land utilization laws is how they were styled. And, and in the center of the United States, I'm going to have to back up too far to show you that map, but in the center of the United States, you notice there's a lot of what are called national grasslands. Have you ever heard of them? I think there's one in Idaho, Curlew National Grassland or something, right? Have you heard of that one? Okay, that's where they came from, these laws. There were counties that, there were people, they couldn't make a living on the land, they were abandoning the land. So the government came in and said, all right, we'll give you 10 cents on the dollar. And they bought up these lands. Rather than the people getting nothing for them, they bought them up. But they didn't buy them to hold on to them for permanent, as a permanent federal enclave or for permanent federal ownership. They were bought up for resettlement. The idea was, and you remember me talking about the farm unit concept that Congress adopted, an amount of land sufficient for the support of the family. You can read the Bankhead Jones Farm Tenant Act, and that's exactly what it says. They bought those lands, the only requirement being the federal government would retain at least 34% of the mineral rights. Here's that split estate again. And the surface was granted as grazing allotments in an amount sufficient for the support of a family. So you can, that's where it starts, 
and like I said, it was a little bit out of order, and then you flip over like this, and it continues right there. Where it says, and this is what it says, uh, that, that any of the land purchased under that act, or this other act, and later they added some more before 1945, or, an, or any other law shall not be held to deprive any state or political subdivision county commissioners thereof of its civil and criminal jurisdiction in and over such property or to impair the civil rights under the local law of the tenants or inhabitants of such property. And insofar as any such jurisdiction has been taken away from the such state or subdivision or any such rights have been impaired, jurisdiction over any such property is hereby ceded back to such state or subdivision. And that's just one example. It's also in the Four Service Organic Act, it's in the Weeks Act of 1911, it's in the Taylor Grazing Act, the same exact language. So when people say, oh, well, the federal government owns the land, they must have jurisdiction, BS, that's bad science, okay? <laughs> and that's what that first case is about. Wilson versus Cook. It's in Arkansas. A guy made a timber purchase. There was a timber sale and he bought the, the timber. And then the state of Arkansas charged him tax on the, for that timber. Now he's a property owner. He owns that timber. He's got to pay tax. It's still standing timber. It hasn't been harvested yet. He says, oh, I don't have to pay that tax. It's, it's on federal land. You have no jurisdiction. And the U.S. Supreme Court said, oh, yeah, state of Arkansas does. And you re read that case and see what the Supreme Court said. The United States is just an owner. And once they sold that timber, they didn't even own that. Now it's private property, whether it's in the National Forest or not. And it can't be taxed. Okay? And it, so, so this idea that you have no jurisdiction over a grazing district, that you have no jurisdiction over a national forest district, is erroneous. It's false. It's a, it's a facade that's put up by these, these federal agencies. It's our land, we own this land. I, I'll tell you this, I'll, I'll give you a hundred bucks if you can show me one single law that refers to BLM land. There's no such thing as BLM land. The BLM doesn't own any land. Bureau of Reclamation? Eh, there's a different, yeah, you want that money. Now, that's, that's a little bit different. The federal government can buy land. Remember, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 has to do with jurisdiction, not with ownership. They can buy land for a federal purpose. Remember the case I told you about with a rancher where they built a reservoir, the federal government built a reservoir, it flooded his, his grazing allotment, his range, and they had to compensate him for it. Okay? But they still, the government still had a right to acquire land in order to build that, that dam because that was considered a legitimate government use. Okay? For building an irrigation reservoir. Now, we could stand here all day and argue about whether or not that's right or not, okay? And I, I, I'm not predisposed to say that it is, but that's the court's decision, not mine, okay? But when looking at this map, though, you can see where the waters of the United States are. These are waters of the United States, Chesapeake Bay, Mississippi River, Ohio. Those are waters, they are navigable waters of the United States. Where in the Constitution does it give Congress authority over navigable waters of the United States? The Commerce Clause, interstate commerce. That's the whole purpose. That's why they can prevent uh, a state, even the state of, of Missouri, if they wanted to build a bridge across the Missouri River, they'd have to get federal approval. 
because they'd have to make sure that bridge is high enough that it doesn't interfere with interstate commerce going up and down that river. If they wanted to build a dam and, and this portion of the Missouri River is entirely, or the Arkansas River is entirely within the state of Arkansas, and they wanted to build a dam, they could not do it without permission of Congress, because Congress has a right under the Constitution to regulate interstate commerce, and I believe that building a dam would definitely interfere with ship ships going up and down that river. Okay, now there's a formula the Supreme Court has developed to determine what constitutes a navigable waterway. And first of all, it has to ebb and flow with the tides. So if that dry wash behind your house doesn't ebb and flow with uh, the moon, okay, it's not navigable. If it can't float a 20 ton displacement vessel, well, it's not navigable. Okay, there's certain rules that the courts have established. So under the appropriation doctrine, um, which came from actually from Spanish and Mexican law, Kearney's Code was the first uh, law referencing it. The law is here to foreign force concerning water courses, stock marks, and brands, horses, enclosures, commons, and arbitration shall continue in force. That's 1846. Um, but it prevails in all the western states. That's what California, the 17 contiguous western states, California v. U.S. I talked to the state engineer in Kansas. I was on a panel with him uh, a year or two ago, and he said in the state of Kansas, they do not have a bifurcated system, uh, even though the 100th Meridian runs right through the middle of their state. They, he said that under their law, the whole state is prior appropriation. Okay, so it just depends on those central states, Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, North and South Dakota. It just depends on whatever their state law is. Nebraska has a bifurcated system. In the eastern half, it's, it's a uh, riparian doctrine. In the western half, prior appropriation. So it just depends on what the state laws are in those states. Um, okay, land use rights uh, under a series of post-Mexico War statutes, Congress recognized and confirmed rights of occupation, cultivation, water rights, ditches, and canals. Act 1853. Here's the citation. That's what I was telling you about. Right of occupation and cultivation on on uh, mineral lands. Act 1866. Uh, this is the, the reference. Reservoirs, pipelines, flumes. Um, and here's some of the cases you can reference uh, in accordance with these. And there's there's a gravel, stone and gravel use under the uh, what's called the Forest Reserve Act, 1891, um, the right to fence in your ranges under this Act, 1885. Um, there's actually timber use rights uh, granted by this Act of uh, 1878. You actually have a right to use timber if you are a resident of a state that has uh, a national forest uh, or a resident of that county, you have a timber use right. And it's right in the Forest Service Organic Act. It actually, uh, we'll, we'll get to that. I'll actually show you that one. Um, okay, the fact that ranchers pay grazing fees. People say, oh, well, they must be leasing it. No, they're not leasing it. There's, grazing fees go for three things. 25% goes to the state and county in lieu of taxes. Why? Because the federal government owns that underlying mineral land, so this county can't really tax it, although in some states they do. California has a grazing tax on grazing allotments. Colorado has a tax on grazing allotments. So they can charge a tax. It's not very much of a tax, but they do charge a tax. But 25% of the grazing fee you pay goes to the state and county for roads and schools. 25% under a 1909 uh, uh, act. Let's see if I have it on here. 25% um, is an administrative charge. When the Forest Service was transferred from the Department of Interior in 1905 to the Department of Agriculture, 
they wrote a letter to the attorney general and said, hey, can we charge a fee? Because when we were under the rules that pertain to Department of Interior, we could charge fees for making maps, doing surveys, stuff like that. Can we charge a fee? And the uh, attorney general said, yeah, sure. Okay, that's all it's based on. I mean, you can look it up. It's in the United States Code. You can go to it, you can read it, it's, it's there. But that's, they, you know, they said that since the, the Department of Interior charged these fees, we think you guys can charge those fees too. So 25% go, is an administrative charge. That's also discussed uh, partially in this case of U.S. versus Grimaud, 1911. Um, and 50% is actually a voluntary refundable contribution. That's what it's called, a contribution. Under the Range uh, Betterment Fund, it was originally, let's see, uh, 1914, okay, it was originally called the Property Improvement Fund Act. Here's the stat, statute, it's at large, 38 stat 430, you can look that up. That's, that, so, so 25, 25, 50, that's 100%. So how much of the grazing fee is a tax? Or a lease? Or a rent? Okay, it's a fee. It's an administrative fee. Just like if you bought a new pickup truck, you would have to go down to the county uh, licensing or, or recorder and buy your license plate and you charge and you pay a fee. Okay, you pay an administrative fee. Does that mean they now own your pickup truck? No, you're just getting the license plate for it. Okay, so the grazing fee is not a rent. Ranchers own their allotments. Um, here's some of the key court decisions pertaining to range rights. Every single Western state uh, this is the first U.S. Supreme Court case specifically saying that a range right is a property right. Griffith v. Dottie, 1885. And that case was decided just very shortly after the 1885 Enclosure Act of Congress passed. Okay, so um, here's a rancher. He comes out, takes up a 160-acre homestead. He goes out on this mineral lands surrounding him, puts cattle out there, occupies it, uh, develops water rights. So he's got three different property rights right there. He's got range rights, he's got water rights, he's got his base property or his homestead. Okay, so then he puts in a ditch, brings down irrigation water, under the Act of 1866, he's got a 50 mile, or excuse me, 50 foot wide easement on either side, 105 foot wide or so right away for ditches and canals. Um, he puts in a few more of these, <coughs> puts in pipelines, ditches, he drills through the ground. In that 1978 case, I told you US, or uh, California versus US, Justice Rehnquist said that under the Desert Land Act, he even had a right to drill a well, drill through the federal land in order to get to water to develop a water right, and that's a legitimate water right. Okay, um, 1897, Congress passes the Reservoir, uh, Livestock Reservoir Site Act, granted 160. It was, again, this was a statutory grant. All you had to do was give a map showing the location of your water to uh, the, the Department of Interior, and that's all that was required. So you had a 160-acre easement around every stock water location. Okay, ranchers built fences under the Act of 1885 that had a right to do so and closed their range. Okay, so there's the improvements. They had a right to build roads and trails. Um, in 1866, people have told me, Oh, RS-2477, that's what that really is, is Section 8 of the Act 1866. That's what RS-2477 is. That's the that law that says uh, the right-of-way for the construction of highways over public lands not reserved for other purposes, hereby granted. Every state highway, every county road that crosses federal lands, partially owned federal lands in the West, has as a right-of-way 
RS2477. Okay? So, in 1866, though, what was a highway? The definition of the term highway. Were, was there any paved roads? There weren't. Okay, there were dirt roads. Okay, if you look in Bobier's dictionary from that time period, a highway is defined as a place for driving livestock. Okay, so every trail or two-track road on this grazing allotment is also an improvement. Okay, so these are just some of the various property rights that ranchers have, granted by acts of Congress. In 1909, Congress, or, uh, the Supreme Court heard a case called Bacon versus Walker from Idaho. And a companion case, Bound versus Walling, over Idaho's two mile limit law. And Arizona and Nevada had similar laws. And the law, the state law said that no one else could graze livestock within two miles of either a stock water source that you own or a, a house, a homestead that you own. Okay, so you impose this two mile limit and pretty soon what do you see? Those, those are your grazing rights. Okay, so even though, even, even if the right of occupation and cultivation that existed under the Act of 1853 wasn't sufficient, this would be, at least for Idaho, Nevada, and Arizona that had these similar state laws. So you see how all of these rights together are what constitute the property that's involved in the sale of one of these ranches. One of those transactions where you sell one of these ranches. Okay, but if you don't know your rights, so, and eh, we'll skip this. Range allotments or units were adjudicated in the National Forest. Um, oh, the Pickett Act in 1912. Uh, in 1910 and 1912, okay, I told you about Teddy Roosevelt. In 1909, he, he sent his report to Congress and his recommendation to Congress, listen, the only way we're going to settle land title in the West, create a split of state. Congress acted on that. Okay, beginning in 1909, in 1910, they passed the Enlarged Homestead Acts. 1910, they passed the Pickett Act, which made every national forest in the West a split estate where the minerals were open for disposal separate from the service. That's under the Pickett Act in 1910. The Forest Service would like you to believe that Congress stopped legislating in 1891. That's what they want you to believe. That they created national forests and that was it. Nothing else. Time out. No more. Okay. But Congress knew there were all these prior existing rights. They'd already passed all these laws. Congress knows their own laws. It's the bureaucrats that don't want you to know about it. Okay. Um, here's some of those... Uh, laws I was talking or cases here's Kenny Coastal Oil versus Kiefer we talked about that one Watt versus Western Nuclear um, you can go to House Report number 35 64th Congress first session talks all about stock raising homesteads the actual name of the stock raising homestead act is an act to provide for stock raising homesteads and for other purposes it was two bills that were combined together one of them, disposing of the grazing lands where people already had range rights recognized under Acts of Congress and making 640-acre homesteads. And they were combined together. And the first six sections of that 11-section law dealt with the granting of 640-acre homesteads. The other uh, five provisions dealt with the disposal of these graze, these rangelands where people already had range rights, already recognized under previous acts of Congress that I just showed you a minute ago. So, uh, the only requirement under the Stock Raising Homestead Act was instead of paying $1.25 an acre, 
you had to make improvements that were worth a dollar twenty-five per acre. Now that's actually a pretty low standard. If you had a headquarters with a house and a barn and fences that was worth one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars, you know that's a hundred thousand acres worth of improvements under that formula. But the uh, Forest Service started doing what they called the Ratchford appraisal in the late eight. 1919 time period and they were trying to determine who had built improvements worth a dollar 25 per acre and Congress said oh to heck with it we're just trying to settle land titles in the West in 1923 they passed what's called a relief act which said okay if you have claims under the stock raising homestead act or the enlarged homestead act either in national forest or outside national forest your title is perfected so as of that date, that's when anybody that can show historically, as Ramona Hage was talking about earlier today, if you can show historically that your ranch existed as of 1923, then your title, your predecessor's title and interest was perfected as of that date. Okay? And so from, from that date forward, from 1923 forward, national forests were, were managed for two things, producing timber and for developing minerals. There was no more homesteading in national forests after 1923. Okay, the Taylor Grazing Act in 1934 was for the purpose of establishing grazing districts throughout the West. And if you go back and you look at the original executive orders, what they cite as authority is not the Taylor Grazing Act, but the Pickett Act of 1910. Go look up those executive orders that established all the grazing districts in the West. It cites the authority as the Pickett Act. This was the intent of Congress, to settle land titles to put an end to disputes between competing rival ranchers, to, to settle where range lines were. Okay, and that's under uh, section eight of the Stock Raising Homestead Act. Okay, but the Forest Service and the BLM would like you to believe that, you know, Congress stopped legislating as of 1891 for national forests. They never dispose of anything. They were, or they'll fudge a little and say, oh, Congress reserved all the timber. Well, yeah, but that's all they reserved was the timber. That's the, the problem is we don't understand this whole split of state concept that Congress adopted and that all these lands were disposed under. Um, Oh, okay, so now we're getting into endangered species. What time is it? Three. Ah, we're gonna skip this. I'll just I'll just um, give you a synopsis. Okay. When was the Endangered Species Act passed? Anybody know? The original Endangered Species Act? When? When? Seventy three? We gotta guess the seventy three. Anybody else? Nixon. Nixon? Anybody else? How about 1913? The original Endangered Species Act was actually passed. I'm going to back up. You guys need to know this. Okay? It was called the Migratory Bird Act. And it was almost immediately held by the federal courts to be unconstitutional infringement on the powers of the states. Okay? Here's the citation right there. Okay? <clears throat> So Congress rewrote the statute in 1918. It was passed following adoption of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1916 with Great Britain. It was tried in the case of Missouri versus Holland, 1920. They said the only reason that that federal regulation of that those, those migratory birds, those endangered birds, was because they were non-resident migratory species. And today they could be in Canada and tomorrow they might be in Missouri. 
and the next day they might be in Mexico. So that is the real formula to apply. Is a grizzly bear migratory? No, it is not. Its range may cross state lines, but it is not migratory. It, it, ha it has a range and it stays in that area. It does not go from Canada in the summer down to Mexico in the winter. It's not a snowbird. Okay? So if it's a resident non migratory species, is a wolf migratory? Okay, it's not. Okay, and this was the formula applied by the Supreme Court. And this, this act, here's something you got to know about acts of Congress. Okay, they are read in what's called paramateria. An act dealing with water rights, unless a later act specifically repeals the first act, they have to be read together as one law. Okay, so all of these, for years this was called the Migratory Bird Act, and then it was called the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and Congress kept amending it. Uh, 1918, okay, it's modified 1929. Um, it was, let's see, you know, by then they passed the, the Federal Power Act, they'd adopted the split of state land policy, in, in U.S. versus New Mexico, the Supreme Court even references this act and says national forests weren't created for wildlife preservation because this act right here required that in order for an area within a national forest to be set aside for one of these uh, endangered birds, they would have to get the approval of the respective state government. Here's what they said, purchase or they could purchase or rent the land. From who? From the rancher. Or water, or land and water, for establishing permanent areas for bird reserves, but only with approval by law of the respective state government. And that's in US versus New Mexico, 1978. Okay, again, it was, it was modified again, 1934, in the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Act. Um, 1946, it wasn't until 1966, 1956, under the, uh, the Commercial Fisheries and Sport Fisheries and Wildlife Bureaus, and then in 1966, uh, that's when they changed it to endangered. The language used in it called it the Endangered Species Act. Okay, so so the the Endangered Species Act has been around a long time, but you have to read every single part of it, going all the way back to 1916. Each part of it. Okay, because it is read in paramateria, as if it's one law. Okay, even, even the 1973 version, uh, section 5 requires compensation for the taking, if they have to take water, land, water, or interest in land, they have to pay compensation. Do you know how many times Section 5 of the Endangered Species Act has been heard or reviewed by the courts? That many times. Zero. Why? Because who brings all these lawsuits? Some environmental group that's trying to make a buck. And they do a sue and a settle because they want to shape and you, you know what, these, these federal employees in Washington, D.C., they're working hand in hand with these groups. Why, and why would they do that? They got jobs to protect. Remember, they got jobs to protect. So, um, oh, here, here's your right 
to cut timber in the National Forest. This is the Forest Reserve Act of 1891. And it's still valid law. It's still protected under Title VII of FLIPMA. In any criminal prosecution or civil action by the United States for trespass on such public timber lands or to recover timber or lumber cut thereon, it shall be a defense if the defendant shall show that the said timber was so cut or removed from the timberlands for use in such state or territory by a resident thereof for agricultural, mining, manufacturing, or domestic purposes and has not been transported out of the same. National forest, forest reserves were established for you. They were established, as, as said in U.S. versus New Mexico, to provide a continuous supply of timber to meet the needs and necessities of the settlers of the arid west. You have an individual right to cut timber for your use. Now, I'm not saying just go out and start cutting timber anywhere you want, unless you want to have some kind of dispute with the Forest Service. But I've seen people, when I worked for the Forest Service, who knew what their rights were, who came in and said, I want a permit to cut timber. And they'd say, okay, that'll be $25. And they said, nope, I have a personal right to cut timber for my own use, free use. And they said, okay, here's your free use permit. So they know what the law is, okay? And this is the law, this is what it says. I show people this and they, oh, you're making this, how am I making this up? The Secretary of Agriculture is hereby directed and required to select, this is the Pickett Act, select, classify, and segregate, or no, excuse me, this was, at, this was passed the same year as the Pickett Act, but what the problem was, in 1910, Congress had a, like a three or four month long investigation of the Forest Service for corruption. Can you believe that? <laughs> okay. So they had like four um, Republicans and four Democrats, and they formed a commit from both the House and the Senate. And they investigated Forest Service, and they said, you know what, we need, and this was at the same time when Teddy Roosevelt said, listen, we gotta create a split of state, we need to dispose of all this land. Congress agreed with them, they, they, they published, uh, uh, like, I don't know how many hundreds of pages in this report, and so then they said, okay, you gotta dispose of this land. And this is what the Congress said. The Secretary of Agriculture is hereby directed and required now, does that sound optional to you? Select, classify, and segregate as soon as practical all lands within boundaries of national forests that may be open to settlement and entry under the homestead laws applicable to national forests. <coughs> it, they, he was ordered to dispose of this land to the, under the laws that are applicable. What were the applicable laws? Okay, the Agricultural Entry of Mineral Lands Act, split, the split estate laws, and that's what they did. And they disposed of all the land in national forests. Okay, and so here you go. Again, which one is this? 19, 1897. This is the Forest Reserve Organic Act of 1897. And here's what, here's what it says. Remember the one I showed you in there? That was 1935. This is 1897. <clears throat> Repetitive. And in the Weeks Act of 1911, it says almost the exact same thing as this. And in the Taylor Grazing Act, almost the exact same wording. The jurisdiction, both civil and criminal, over persons within such reservations shall not be affected or changed by reason of the existence of such reservations except so far as the punishment offenses against the United States herein is concerned. The intent and meaning of this provision being the state wherein any such reservation is situated shall not by reason of establishment thereof lose its jurisdiction, nor the inhabitants thereof their rights and privileges as citizens or be absolved from their duties uh, as citizens of the state. You know when the first forest reserves were established? 
1817. They were, they were naval timber reserves. There was certain oak trees that they valued for building shipbuilding. Okay, so this concept that, oh, the government, they, they, the federal government can't reserve timber or they can't reserve minerals. They've been doing it since almost the very beginning of the country for specific purposes, limited purposes. And the purpose of the present day national forest we have was to provide timber for you, the residents of the state of Idaho. And the Supreme Court said so in U.S. versus New Mexico in 1978. That's why in under Title VII of FLIPMA, okay, here's the same thing. This is the Weeks Act. The jurisdiction, both civil and criminal, over persons. The exact same language. I'm not going to read the whole thing over again. You just heard it. That's why in that first case, Wilson versus Cook, 1946, the U.S. Supreme Court says, there's no federal jurisdiction here. They, the, the federal government owns the timber. They can sell the timber, but once they sold it, there's no federal jurisdiction. We just have forgotten what the whole purpose of all these statutes were. We've forgotten what our rights are. And because we rely on these federal employees, where do you think they get their information from? The guy that was here before talking about um, Glenn Canassa, I, ha I had a meeting with Glenn Canassa in Washington, D.C. about two years ago. We were trying to stop the Bears Ears National Monument. We were working with San Juan County, Utah. They know what your rights are. After the county... Um, chairman of the county commission made the presentation myself and my consulting partner were there michael bean the acting secretary of interior was there and, and his head staff lawyer and uh, i can't remember the gal's name and kanasa uh, and uh, neil corns he was sitting right next to me and the very first question when we got done making the presentation the very first question, we hadn't even brought this up, purposely had not brought it up. There, there, Michael Bean says, well, we want our staff attorney to ask a couple questions first. The very first question he asks, he says, so are you saying that ranchers own their lots? And we hadn't even brought it up. These guys know the truth. They know what the law is, but they are covering their own backside. Because to them, it's all about saving jobs. Because if you knew what your rights are, and you knew, uh, let, let, let's, let's go on here. Okay, um, here, 1936. Let's see, I think that's the one that I gave you guys. No, uh, yeah, I think that is. Oh, here, here we go, timber. Remember the Hammonds in Oregon got thrown in jail for, for burning up, supposedly burning up arson, federal timber, blah, blah, blah. Here's this law that, uh, that says, oh, you can't, you can't do that unless, it says, unless an allottee sets or causes to be set any fire in the reasonable exercise of his proprietary rights in the allotment. So the law that they should have been charged under was this one. Because, but they knew they couldn't get him under this one. Because he is excused by Congress under this act. So they said that he was a terrorist instead. Okay, here we are. We're back to where we started. Title Seven of FLIPMA. Okay, now there's four more pages to this. But you, and, and you can look it up. I want you to look them up so that you can see what it looks like. But what it is is nothing but a list. One after another, probably a hundred or more laws. All these laws we've been talking about, the grant and all these rights, those, those were repealed 
under Plymouth. But what does it start out saying? Nothing in this act or in any amendment made by this act shall be construed as terminating any valid lease, permit, patent, right of way, or other land use right or authorization existing on the date of approval of this act. And right down here at the bottom, that's what it says. All actions, not some, not the ones that he feels like, you know, all. All actions by the Secretary concerned, and when it says Secretary concerned, it means both Secretary of Interior and Secretary of Agriculture. Concerned under this act shall, that's not discretionary, shall be subject to valid existing rights. Problem is, people don't know what their rights are. They don't know and realize that Congress granted all these rights. Okay, and I just showed you a few of them. We could be here for a whole week talking on this. And I've already talked too long. You guys are starting to nod off or something. <laughs> but here's the same day, I want to tell you, the same day this was passed, or maybe it was the next day. No, nope, the next day, October 22nd. This is the National Forest Management Act. Okay? FLIPMA also applies to national forests for planning purposes. But the National Forest Management Act, oh, can I also, I want to point out again, since we're talking about timber, there it is, B, notwithstanding any provision of this act, in the event of conflict with or inconsistency between this act and the acts of 1937 and 1939, insofar as they relate to management of timber, these, I need to, to change that and move that down. But those two acts prevail, 1937 and 39 Act, which both put emphasis on uh, the economic contribution to local communities. Okay? But here's the National Forest Management Act. <clears throat> it starts out sounding pretty bad. It says resource plans and permits, contracts, and other instruments for the use and occupancy, there's that word again, of national forest system lands shall be consistent with land management plans. That sounds kind of ominous. It says it's got to be consistent with the plan, except, you know, when I worked for the foresters, they sent out a letter to all the regional foresters, and they quoted this section because they wanted to make sure everybody knew, you know, you're, you're, you, all you, everything you do has to be consistent with the plan. They quoted it all the way down to, let's see, right there. And they left off this last sentence. And when I read that memo, I, I said, wait a minute. There's something missing. I've read this before, and this doesn't sound right. So I went and looked it up, and sure enough, they left off the last sentence because the last sentence says, any revision, not some, not the ones you feel like, any revision in present or future permits, contracts, and other instruments made pursuant to this section shall be subject to valid existing rights. You know, even though you might feel it, no offense, Mr. Fulcher sitting back here, some of you guys think that Congress is dumb. They are not. They know their own laws. What you have been told, in my opinion, now this is strictly my opinion now, I think they've been lying to you. The BLM and the Forest Service, the BLM and the Forest Service have been lying to you. All these years, they've been lying to you. They interpret the law. I don't know if I told you this. I, I think I did. That it's worth mentioning again. When I, when I told my boss, I said, don't you... Don't you believe these guys have rights? Why don't we just recognize their rights? We have jobs to protect. Okay? And when I told him the ranchers own the water rights and the Supreme Court said so, he said, we think the Supreme Court is wrong. Okay? Now, what kind of arrogance is that? They are looking out for what's their best good. It's time for you to start looking out for what's your best good. And when you have all this information, all you have to do is take that page out of the Forest Service Organic Act that says, bam, 
the state does not lose its jurisdiction just because this is a national forest. We have the jurisdiction. And when you realize that, and these BLM or Forest Service guys go out there and they start closing your roads, those aren't their roads. Okay? You need to have a county commission and a sheriff and a county attorney that's ready to enforce law and maybe throw a few bureaucrats in jail for 30 days for disturbing the peace. Okay? Because that's the only thing that's going to have a chilling effect is when these people become accountable for their own actions. If I work for the post office and you came down to the post office and I went out of the post office and I'm in the post office parking lot and I take a ball peen hammer and I start wailing the crap out of your car and busting windows and I claim, well, I work for the federal government. I can do whatever I want. You're on post office land now, buddy. Okay? Okay, do I get away with that? That is way outside the scope of my authority. It doesn't matter if they work for the federal government. They're still accountable. I work for the federal government. I went to the Forest Service Law Enforcement Training, and I know that they are accountable when they go beyond the scope of their authority. They are personally accountable. The federal government has no obligation to back them up in court. But we have a Department of Justice. You guys know about our Department of Justice, right? Okay. So they need to clean house there. But this is the law. This is the law. And so here we come. This is where we started. We're back to where we started. Okay. Federal public land surface and subsurface. Does that have a different meaning to you now? Okay. They might own some minerals out here. I'd say they'll probably own most of this. Okay. But, and some of this is Indian reservation. Like right there, a big chunk of Arizona, that's Navajo reservation right there. The Indians own the mineral rights in Indian reservations. Okay, this is no different. The policy that they pursued in this split of state policy is not really any different than the reservation and assimilation policy that they followed for Indians. Okay, the timber within Indian reservations belongs to the tribe. So even if there's individual allotments, the timber belongs to the tribe, the mineral rights belong. Okay, and it's the same thing in all of these so-called public lands. Because what makes something public land? It's got to be open for settlement or entry. So if you own a grazing allotment, does that mean you can stop somebody from coming in drilling for oil or gas? No. Okay, so I've been successful today. You guys have learned something, I hope. Okay, does this, any of this make sense? Does most of it make sense? Okay, and I've showed you the laws. You can look it up. And you may go home tonight and say, this sounds too fantastic. I just can't believe that we've been lied to by the BLM all these years. Okay, well, that's fine. I'm not telling you you have to change your mind. But I'm telling you, I've showed you what the law is. I've given you copies to read yourself. You can read the opinion of the Supreme Court. If you've been taking notes, you can go read U.S. versus New Mexico. Okay? This. So here's my conclusion. Federal policy analysis reveals congressional intent to grant split estate property rights. The Constitution, Congress, and the courts held states own and control resident non-migratory species. Federal regulation is limited to interstate commerce and treaty regulation of non-resident species. Federals must, feds, feds must pay for land, water, or interest in land for T&E programs. It doesn't matter why the government wants your property. 
All it matters to you is if they take your property, you get paid for it. Here's a quote. I'm going to end with this quote. This is by Neil Gorsuch. Have you heard of him? Okay. He was, he was on the Tenth Circuit Court in Colorado, before we went to the Supreme Court. This was a case, Entech GRB LLC versus Stowe Ranches. When you own property in the West, you don't always own everything from the surface to the center of the earth. Someone else might own the minerals lying underground and the right to access some. Someone else still might own the right to the use of water flowing through your property. All this can invite confusion and litigation. Ours is such a case of battle between ranchers and miners over property claims that trace back to separate government grants an age ago. Stowe runs a grouse hunting business on its service estate in rural Colorado. Entech leases from the federal government the right to explore and develop minerals under much of Stowe's and adjoining service estates. So this was his opening statement in this case. We've got at least one Supreme Court justice, like Justice Rehnquist, a Westerner who understands that we have split estate property rights. And that is the end of my presentation. So. And since, since there's no questions, and you all understand everything, <laughs> there's one gentleman back here. So uh, this is a question on uh, Title VII, the occupation of your handout, uh, section, subsection F. Okay. Nothing in this act shall <coughs> repeal any, any existing law by implication. Right. Okay, um, I, repeal by implication is an argument that's been used at times when a Congress passes a new law and it appears to conflict with a previous law on the same subject. Okay, the, the argument would be, well, Congress obviously intended to repeal this previous law. That is not the case. The courts have never accepted that. And that is why in FLIPMA, uh, when you look at Title VII, when you look it up and you start reading the second and the third and the fourth page, line after line of specific laws that are repealed. Okay, but you got to remember that, that Title VII is not about extinguishing rights. It's about freezing in time, at that point in time, all rights that were then in existence. Okay, so repeal by implication, that, that just means, well, it implies that this previous law is no good. No, until it's actually repealed, it's still valid. So the Act of 1866 was valid all the way up until October 22, 1976. Okay? Yes, sir? I have two questions. Sorry, just one. Go ahead, knock <laughs> away. First off, um, our county has a road ordinance that was signed by previous county clerks that said it's basically that no road shall be placed based on public safety unless authorized by the county clerk and the sheriff. We just had a guy go into court Thursday to try and repeal that. What can I give to the judge to use to say, Right, right. Well, Title Seven. Um, let me. Uh, one of the things I was going to do was was get a couple of URLs that I can give you, so that you can. Um, Justia. That's a good website for any of the court cases. For the statutes at large, you can go to the Library of Congress, and there's there's another place that I use. Um, let me see if I can pull that up real quick. <clears throat> Um, not yet. I'm already connected, so we could flip it over here. Okay. Okay. What do you want? What's your? I don't know, I don't know if this will work or not, but if it does, I can at least get the URL. What's your website? Do you know? 
Um, that's when I, I got it. Oh. That's when I've got it saved. I saved oh, okay. it so okay. that so I don't have to look it up every time. Very top one. It should take you to a page that you got to put this access code in. Okay, this URL right here, US code, US C O D E dot house dot gov. Mr. Folger, don't shut me down from this. Okay. <laughs> Keep going. Uh, US code dot house dot gov slut backslash. Stat viewer, S T A T viewer dot H T M question mark. I mean, it's a long thing. That's why. That's why I can't tell you this because I saved it in my favorites. So every time I want to go to this, I just hit on my favorites, and then I and then I got it. Um, then there's a question mark. Then volume equals now. Now this can be anything, um, but I always go to this page. I start I, just because this is the one I, I saved. And this, this takes you to um, uh, the Stock Raising Homestead Act. But the Stock Raising Homestead Act is volume 39, and then it has the and sign, page equals 865, and then I believe that's the hashtag sign there. Equals Yeah, it says it's an equal sign, then 865, and then the hashtag sign. And if you if you go to that and then you save it in your favorites or your bookmarks, then anytime you want to look up any of these statutes that I gave you, all you have to do is type in the volume. Let's say it's let's say the, the citation is 39 stat uh, 865. You would type in 35 and 865 and then just hit get document. And it takes you right to that page in the statutes at large. So you can look up any of these these laws. So my second question. Yes, sir. I had a permittee call me. It's uh, all very nice that we know all these laws, but what if our politicians don't know them? Well, how, what good is it going to do? There. <laughs> well, that's why you get great I county commissioners right there. and sir? great state legislatures like Judy over there. I'm pointing you guys out. Yes, I am. Okay. And then you go to them and you you say, hey, here's the law. And you lay that down in front of them very politely. Because this isn't a forest service or BLM. These are the people that are going to help me. You very politely lay that down in front of them and you explain to them, you know, we have rights. And Congress has protected our rights. Under Title VII of FLIPMA, our rights are protected. Congress wanted to make sure that we maintain our rights and that the county and the state maintains their jurisdiction. And that's what you say. And you get them to help you. So there's no reason why the Forest Service should ever close a road on a grazing allotment. Because right. They don't have the right to do that. And then you all, and here's another, you all write a letter to President Trump saying, we want to make Angus McIntosh the grazing czar. <laughs> 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 
or something like that. Maybe he called like special assistant, special assistant to the president. Or, or you convince Congressman Fulcher to hire me to work for him, and then you know we'll save the people in Idaho, and the rest of them can sing. Yeah. <laughs> Next, um, you, I'll let you get one more question. Go ahead, sir. I'm sorry. My second question was: I have a permittee called me the other day. He said he he normally comes out for ear care. He said. Poor supervisor absolutely promised him he was going to cut off ear care. And Wayne Hunt said he's lying to you. He won't let you turn out where he's sick. So they had a conversation. The poor supervisor said, No, the choice of me cutting off ear care when I left you, and Wayne Hunt said, No, you're not. What's his report? And where do I start with him to be able to historically fill in? Um, I'd say the poor supervisor is the boss of the range conservationists. Poor supervisor is a line officer. Okay, and right, and, and here's something. Uh, here, here's the problem with these bureaucracies: is every single office, district office, you've got a different person in charge. I've had ranchers that have gone in with the exact same situation you're talking about. And they, and they said, okay, you have to fill out your annual operating plan. So they fill it out, and they crossed out what the Forest Service put in there, and they put that 300 head and turned it back in, and the, the forest ranger didn't say a thing, and they went ahead, and everything was fine. And I've had other ones that got in a, um, a contest of wills. You know where you've got these district rangers say, "I'm I'm in charge of this land," you know, and so it varies. And I wish I I wish it wasn't like that, but maybe with the Trump administration, maybe things are going to change. Doesn't that go back to economic impact? Yeah, and I, it, absolutely it does. Okay, and I don't know any rancher that wants to turn out more cattle than what he knows his range can support. Okay, he's gonna turn out the number of head that he needs to turn out and that he believes that, that range can support. Okay, they're not gonna put out more because they're there for the long run. Okay, now this gentleman that's leaving now, he had a question. I didn't mean to insult you, sir. Uh, no, I'm just going to ask you, did any of this information come up with the, uh, the Bunkerville trial? Um, you know, I, I actually was a expert witness in the Oregon trial for the Malheur people up there. Uh, and I submitted uh, a very detailed analysis of the wild... Uh, the bird refuge up there, which there's hundreds of these laws, but the law that was specific to the Molecule Refuge, they were the government was actually ordered by Congress to sell that land, or no, not to sell, to dispose. The language was dispose. Well, how did they dispose of these things? As grazing allotments. Okay, they were actually required to dispose of it as a grazing allotment back in the 1940s, okay? The problem is these federal agencies ignore the law. They make their own law. What is beneficial to them is, they say, well, we can interpret it any way we want. Interpreting is one thing. Rewriting it and ignoring it is another. But my testimony was the judge sealed my written te testimony so that it couldn't be used. Now, I don't know why judges can do those things, but they ended up winning anyway, so it wasn't necessary. Whatever happened in Title 42 actions against these people acting under color of law, did they make up? Um, you know, I actually, <laughs> this is funny, I think, but I actually filed a Bivens suit against a park ranger one time because I got a speeding ticket 
And I just didn't feel like paying the speeding ticket. And I lived near the Grand Canyon National Park, and I knew this guy, and he was a joker anyway, and I mean that in a, in a negative way. Um, <laughs> he, but but I, I happen to know for a fact that the federal government has no jurisdiction over Grand Canyon National Park. And I, I mean, I've showed you some of the statutes. So I told the, the U.S. attorney, I said, I'm not paying that ticket. You guys don't have jurisdiction for, for, for speeding tickets. And he said, oh, well, we're going to prosecute you and blah, 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 and everything. So I wrote a following brief and sent it in, and I waited to hear back. And I waited, and I waited and waited about three months. Never heard anything back from these people. I was starting to get worried. You know? Are they going to send the marshals after me or what for a speeding ticket? And one day I get home, and on my answering machine, there's a phone call from this guy. And the last time I talked to him, he was like, well, we're going to have money on our own. You know, this time it's like, um, Mr. McIntosh, this is so-and-so, the U.S. Attorney, and I'm just calling to let you know we dropped that charge, and that park ranger doesn't work for the Park Service anymore, and if you have any questions at all, just please don't hesitate to call. And that was it. Or what about the rest of these Title 42? Well, um, you know, they should be held accountable, but who is, who's the enforcer? It's got to be you, because do you think Except in the case, I'll say this, except in the case where a Forest Service Ranger takes the government truck down to the bar and gets drunk and runs it off the road and crashes it, they're not going to prosecute their own people. They cover up their own doo-doo pretty well, okay? They cover for each other. They, they do. Their job is to protect the reputation of their agency. They've got jobs at stake. You know what? Nancy Pelosi was complaining that Trump had not, well, I, I don't want to get political. But, okay, okay. <laughs> Nancy Pelosi was complaining that Trump had not passed a jobs bill because he had not created any federal jobs. That's their idea yeah. of job creation. Yeah. You create a new agency. You add more bureaucrats. That's job creation to one side of the political spectrum. The other side of political spectrum is, let's put the loggers back to work. Let's enforce the laws that's written. Let's put the ranchers back out there. Let's open up the land for more oil and gas drilling. Let's put people to work. Let's make the economy grow and create jobs the natural way. Okay, but the way when I worked for the Forest Service, their view was we've got jobs to protect. And the more regulations you have, the more regulators you need. You know how bureaucracy works? If, if you're a GS 14 district ranger, the only way you get to GS 15 is if you have more people working for you. So you justify hiring two more biologists. Oh, we found an endangered species. We need more biologists. You hire two or three more biologists and archaeologists, and man, now you oh, I'm not I'm not supervising ten people anymore. Now I got fifteen people. I should be a GS fifteen. And you get a pay raise. That is literally how bureaucracies work. So, sorry, I didn't mean to get political. Any other questions? <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, my name is Wood. They're trying to implement new uh, wilderness areas in the National Forest, in the South, Grand Salas National Forest. And this has just come out on the wall here. Um, but I know a couple of state legislators that if they were to pass a bill that said there would be no more wildernesses in Idaho, would that Um, d you may not be aware of this, but I believe it was in the 1960s, I want to say. Um, Wyoming, the Wyoming delegation in Congress got a law passed that there would be no more um, national parks in Wyoming. 
Okay, so you can get specific laws passed for your state. And so, and if you're, if you're, well, here's the thing. If you re read the original Wilderness Act, the Wilderness Act actually has two real purposes. To stop mining and to stop logging. If you read the act as a whole, that's the only two things that it really does. Okay, because grazing is grandfathered in under that act. And a lot of people don't know that. And that's another thing where they tell ranchers, oh, you can't go fix that, that reservoir because it's a wilderness area. It's actually in the Wilderness Act to be able to do that. But the thing is, I think the biggest problem is we don't use the law that already exists. I don't think we need a whole lot of new laws. I think we need to start enforcing the laws that already exist. And, and, and plus, you know, I told you I went to Washington, D.C. to try to stop that Bears Ears. Okay, what they did was they put a whole provision in the Bears Ears, um, in that presidential executive order, that says, that basically repeats the same thing as Title VII. This doesn't affect any prior existing right. This will not have any effect on existing rights, so on and so forth. The thing is, it doesn't do them any good unless they know what their rights are. You, you see? And the bureaucrats, when you allow bureaucrats to get away with that, then... But they do have the jurisdiction. The state does have the jurisdiction to do that. You know what? I, that is, you know, the federal government can make any designation they want, but as long as they put that savings provision in there, they're basically covered. So then what you're saying is that if that provision is in there, then the state can just ignore <coughs> the, the restrictions that the federal government tried to put in place. And say, well, the system, right? I, this is where I think it may even be you that was asking me about, how about the transfer of public lands? Okay, now that we can be conversant in public lands, now that we all know what public lands really is, now would be a good time to talk about transfer of the mineral rights to the state or to the timber rights. That's a good place to start. Maybe the county. Okay, so, so you, you, but we, ought, we gotta have a starting place. We have to understand what laws are in place so we have a starting place to work from, okay? Any other questions? Am I past my time? Do you have somebody else ready to go here? No, we're not. Oh, okay. No, we're okay. Because I thought Judy was going to get up here. Anyway. No, no. Okay. Or, you know. Thank you. What a wonderful Anyway, on the Salmon Chalice Forest Revision, which they started, last plans were from 88 and 87. If you uh, look at that green area to the left, that's the Frank Church Wilderness. Okay, and, and uh, here, down here is, uh, oh gosh, um, more wilderness in the other green. But uh, what we have here is, uh, we're supposed to be rewriting the plan for multiple use. And every meeting that's been held for the past year and a half has been about wildernization of this area. And if you look at the orange, and um, let's see, that is new, okay. new wilderness evaluation. Oh, thank you, thank you. And then uh, the yellow is wilderness uh, evaluation areas. So I live here. I live right there. There's Hecla Mine. There's Thompson Creek. There's two gold mines up here in uh, Lemhi County. Everything's under about a 10 to 12 year permit, almost ready to get there. This is what they're talking about. They want to lock this out, and there's roads everywhere. This is not pristine areas, but what was identified in a meeting we just had recently in Chalice 
is that here the Forest Service has been locking the gates, denying us access, and now they say, oh, there's no roads there. We can make it wilderness. So this is all for decades have been in the works to lock us out. Um, but this map I just got a hold of a couple of days ago, and I'm just sick about it. <laughs> I'm just sick about it. Anyway, so they are going to lock us out. Uh, and then the Wild and Scenic Rivers, that's another big boondoggle. So they're going to go a half mile uh, each way from a river and now just, got, uh, just you know, get, take away, try to take away your mining claims. They're going to get, try to keep the ranchers out from having their cattle over there. Of course, no logging whatsoever within a uh, waterway corridor. But, but it is, this is what we're looking at. It is not multiple use. And I, I think we're looking at a class action lawsuit. I know uh, the uh, Custer County commissioners do try to use coordination, but we have a forest super, super, uh, supervisor that's been trained in the old, from the old books that no, we're, this is preservationist and we want more wilderness. And, and that's what they're trying to do here. But that is shocking to me. So in an, an initial assessment, it said that we would have 400 acres out of 4.4 million to log. Our, our winter wood in the summertime that we gather, we have 400 acres. It's like, what in the heck are you talking about? But so these really light green areas, and like you can't really see them too well, they're, they're not up there. So, so that's what we're dealing with. I mean, I think it's almost gotten to the point for the Salmon Chalice Forest on this plan rewrite they're not listening to us. And last uh, December, I created the Lumpi Custer Grassroots Advisory. There's 182 members, and these are ex-foresters, retired for whatever. And we're providing comments. They're not listening to any of them right over their head. That's what we're dealing with. So I'm really glad you're here. I'm going to need to go through everything you've just given us. But, but this, if, if we don't do something fast, we're going to have so much more wilderness here. And everybody in that community does not want wilderness. There, there's as more people than this in a room, in the library, having meetings with me or town hall meetings, uh, and Forest Service people are sitting over there and said, how many of you want more wilderness? Nobody raises their hand. How many of you want more wild and scenic? Nobody raises their hand. I said, will you guys take note? Here's your comment period right here. These people don't want any more, but they don't care. So th th yes, uh, anyway, this is frightening stuff. Is your sheriff? Our sheriff, no. He's dealing with other issues. Yeah, he, he, is, he isn't on board. The county commissioners are pretty strong on the coordination, but Lumpi County isn't because everybody in Lumpi County is married to either a BLM or Forest Service person. <laughs> and that is a problem. It is a problem. But anyway, uh, this is just a good e example of what's coming toward you because Boise County will be next, Payette, and they're all in my district. I have all these forests. And I know Judy goes to a bunch of them, Vicki goes to a bunch of them in the Payette, but we have got to remain diligent. We need to show up and say no. We, we, I mean, we need some torches and pitchforks to pass around to folks because <laughs> it's gone to that point. I think it's gone to that point. But anyway, um, Angus, I wish you could hang around with me for a few weeks because I'd sure love to take you to some of these meetings. They are something else. But that's what's going on in the Salmon Chalice. So if you're familiar with it, we, we need to be diligent fighting it. Any questions? Any questions from anybody? Yes. What's blocking the court? Yeah. Uh, we have a forest supervisor who no, does. No, I, I don't have one. Um, so you have a question about deer vocals, correct? Excuse me, what? Deer vocals. You can vocals coordination? Yes. Okay. Yes. So they did not respond? They will coordinate on some things, but not everything. Okay. Did they respond saying that uh, yes, we'll leave you on such and such date, or did they say that they're going to try? I, I have not been involved in that. We have an NRAC committee, a National Resource advisory council and they're the ones who meet with the county commissioners with them. I'm not on that committee and I mean I haven't attended those meetings. Okay. Yeah so I, I don't know exactly what's happened but I know the county uh, the county commissioners have asked for coordination on other issues and uh, opening gates and so forth. Sometimes they'll work with you and sometimes they won't. They don't have an option. I know they, they don't have an option but we actually had the BLM and Forest Service officials from um, DC come out we held a big coordination meeting and uh, the forest supervisor just walked and stood out in the parking lot during a six hour meeting. He wasn't gonna listen to any of it. But we also aren't implementing good neighbor authority. So here we have, by law, I mean, we're supposed to, what I understand, we're supposed to be managing allowed, the state is allowed to manage land 
uh, through this good neighbor authority. My supervisor won't do it, Payettes won't do it, they will not do it, but up north in uh, region one they will do it and have done it successfully. And so we need to get the good neighbor authority going. So, uh, who manages the land? The, the, the county or? The management of the land is public land. So Custer County is 97% public, public land. land. And so we need the state to, excuse me? It's not public land. This is our land. Our multiple use land. Multiple use land. Multiple use land. Me too. So anyway, that's where we're at. We have, it's our four supervisors. They're so ingrained and you can't get rid of them. It's hard to get rid of them. It is Y2Y. I mean, that shows it right there. And that was on your map, Angus, the one with the blue. That's the blue area right there. That's the total blue area. So anyway, let it burn. That's right, that's the let it burn area. Any other questions? Maybe not. For, for, if you have board of commissioners and the sheriff and the county council on board, is essentially a yes? Well, I know that um, here's, here's, here's some things that I think would work. Um, I know that, for example, in Colorado, the Forest Service has to spray for weeds because every landowner has to control weeds on their property. So um, I think there are certain, when it comes to certain uh, items or certain things, for example, there's a Supreme Court case where uh, call, called Colorado versus Toll, and Toll was the, the park supervisor for the Rocky Mountain National Park. And in the wintertime, he closed down the state highway, saying, oh, it's too dangerous. And the state said, those are our roads. Under RS-2477, you can't close them down. And the U.S. Supreme Court said, you're right. The federal government can't close those down. Those are state roads. So, you know, I think every situation has to be analyzed and looked at to make sure that you have a good sound legal argument to base it on, but um, you know, so I, I think you just have to look at whatever your situation is and try to analyze it from the most, I guess, advantageous angle or perspective that you can attack it from. If four, and I just have two more things, um, Thank you all for coming. I hope it was worth it. Um, and <laughs> I thank Representative Boyle for picking up the tab for the room. And I got Angus here. I didn't get money for his speaking fee, however. So Farm Bureau is, is putting in um, some money for that and yeah, providing yeah. some sticks. So yeah, that, if you guys would yeah, maybe yeah. put some money in for Angus's speaking fee, we would be so grateful because he's been with every second. And then I just wanted to ask Congressman Coulter if he would like to say a couple, get a couple minutes in that he would like to address. He's been in uh, D.C. What's their feeling back there? <laughs> yeah, so, so thank you. And uh, this is, this is uh, on my educational experience here. And, and, uh, so literally, I came straight from the airport here. I sat down and uh, came in before 1 o'clock. So uh, uh, I've been from Missouri in the last two weeks. It's going to be worried.